Uh, thank you ever so much for coming and thank you very much for the invite. It's a great honour uh, to give this year's lecture. When uh, Mark asked me if I'd give the lecture, I think he said it was in April this year, and what I wanted to give it on, I said, well, let's do it on Europe. I've got a lot of maps of Europe. Uh, let's do a lecture about what a wonderful place the continent is and how much the British people don't know about it but how they're now going to learn about it because they voted to remain in the EU for another generation. That'll be fun. Uh, there'll be loads of people still arguing we should leave. Uh, so let's just do something that kind of goads them a bit and says we don't really understand the geography of the continent. And I was wrong. Luckily, uh, Mark was clever enough to say, let's just wait for the result before we pick the title. Uh, I wasn't the only person who was wrong. The polls were wrong. Most importantly, the spread betting was wrong, and that's where people are actually investing their own money to bet on what they think the result will be. And if you can remember, the spread betting in the days before the 23rd of June moved to say that a Remain majority looked pretty likely. And then, even more importantly than the spread betting, the people who really bet an enormous amount of money, the money markets moved. They moved within 15 minutes of the news of the MP being stabbed. Uh, and by the day before, it looked as if it was going to be a Remain result. And then we woke up and we didn't get that. And that's very interesting. And what I'm going to talk to you about literally for 30, 35 minutes, because I'm most interested in your questions, is speculation about why and what it means. Now, this is speculation in hindsight. The only way you can really show that you know about something is if you predict it and it happens. That's kind of proper science. You know, then you can be confident about a speaker if they've done that. That's how somebody produces a medicine and then tests it. Um, and as I called it wrong, I'm certainly not in that category. However, I'm not the only one. I would claim that not a single serious commentator or pundit called the result, let alone explained what its geography would be beforehand. The more knowledgeable and older people who were involved in these things went quiet about three months before the referendum. But nobody, if anybody tells you that they knew what was going to happen and they'd written something and it's there, I haven't uh, yet seen that. So nobody knew. This map you're looking at um, was one of these series of maps that I was going to show you. I'm only going to show you two of these tonight. This is a map of the countries that are either in the European Union or were seeking to join the European Union or still are seeking to join the European Union. Uh, it's done by the colour of the rainbow. The purple ones are the original uh, steel and coal union. And as countries get closer, for instance, a part of free trade agreements like Switzerland, which is coloured yellow, it goes through. The Eastern European countries are coloured green because they joined relatively recently. We haven't put Greenland in, which is the only place that actually has left. Um, and Turkey's coloured red, slightly frighteningly. It looks like it's about to come in and eat Europe. Uh, that's just how the maps are created. Because Turkey, in the long run, is applying uh, to join. ...created with the EU. And the map looks strange because it's area proportional to population. So you can see how important the UK is in terms of people to the rest of Europe. Important, but not that important. The rest of Europe could carry on quite happily with us completely out of it. In fact, it's even possible that the rest of Europe could carry on much better than it has been carrying on with us completely out of it. I think it's worth thinking what the EU might be able to do without the UK sitting there saying, no, you can't do that, please keep bankers' salaries secret, all the other things we tried to do. There is one argument 
that says that we were never properly in the EU, we had these exemptions, we didn't pay our way fully, we didn't behave properly. And if we're going to leave, fine, we can come back on equal terms with everybody else when we finally realise we're not that special. I hear that argument quite a lot, quietly, from polite people on, on the mainland. We had an unfair deal, it's a bit sad we're going, but we should come back in a different way. You have to memorise that map, because I'm going to show you another map in a minute that depends on you knowing where places are on that map. This graph looks very, very boring, but it's the most important graph I'm going to show you. Um, for me, this is what explains what's been going on more than anything else. And the crucial date was not the 23rd of June 2016, the crucial date was 2008. Because in 2008, our economy tanked and we began a recession which was deeper and longer than the 1929 recession. And this is average GDP per capita. And that's the gap between where we could have expected to have been and where we are. And if you're older enough, you might remember the little 1970s recession or three million, un three million unemployed in the 1980s and what happened to this city. You can just about see it there, or the tiny 1990s recession. What happened after 2008 blows all of those out of the water. We've had dropping living standards since 2008. You know we've had huge cuts since 2008. My summary of, of what happened is that our most profitable industry, which was finance and banking, which accounted for 12% of our GDP, while only requiring 4% of our workforce, overnight became completely non-profit making. People sometimes complain about the government bailing it out and say, why did they bail out the financial industry when they didn't bail out the mines in 1984 and they didn't bail out the shipyards? The way I see this is it was similar to the coal mines in 1910 when coal was at the peak of our production. We had more people down coal mines than we've ever had before or since. Imagine in 1910 that the coal suddenly disappeared from underground and what that would have done to the country. Or imagine the shipyards in 1920 suddenly silting up and not being able to be used. This industry that we had come to rely on at its most profitable point it had ever been in history suddenly ceased to be profitable at all. And Lloyd's are still laying people off today. You, you can still read news about it. Now we know it ceased to be profitable because it was making money out of fooling people. Yeah, and it was doing things which were immoral, wrong, you don't actually do great social good out of banking. We can argue about that later, and I promise not to go on too long, so you can argue back to me if you want to claim that great social good is done out of banking. But the importance of the financial crash, the worldwide financial crash for us, is that it hit our most profitable industry at its very peak. And that hasn't happened to an industry in Britain before quite so suddenly. Our second most profitable industry, by the way, is education, higher education. For 10 years before I moved to Oxford, I worked in Sheffield. And just before I left Sheffield, we worked out that the export earnings of Sheffield University and Hallam University put together, the amount of money that we brought into South Yorkshire in overseas feed for Chinese and Indian students, and when their parents came for graduation, the total amount of money uh, that the two universities in Sheffield were generating was greater export earnings than the entire metal industry of South Yorkshire. And the metal industry of South Yorkshire is still relatively profitable because it's actually an arms industry. But we like to call it metal because it doesn't sound so bad. Um, and that's relevant over what might happen over Brexit. You know, having lost one industry's profits, you then go and take the most profitable part of another one. Uh, and destroy it. And that, it's that backdrop, I think, in hindsight that matters. If you're trying to understand 
Why did so many people vote to leave? Life was not good for many people, but not, not badly affecting many commentators. I wasn't particularly badly affected by the crash in 2008. I kept a job. Lots of people in West London who appear on the telly were doing okay. But for the average family in Britain, they were particularly affected. Let's move on from that to what looks like a very boring table. Why is the UK the first country in the EU to leave after Greenland? It's not just that we have had the biggest drop in living standards since the war, and as, as I come on later, this is accompanied with the first falls in life expectancy since 1940, which will be reported in the next few months, if not next year, depending on the cuts to ONS and whether anybody gets around to calculating our life expectancy figures. Um, it's not just that we've had a fall in our incomes, and we've had to cut social services, and we've had to cut councils, and we've had to cut the money we spend on 16 and 17 year old children in schools, we've had education cuts, and we're not spending on health like we used to spend, which was still the lowest in Europe per capita apart from Italy and Greece. It's also that we are the most economically unequal country in Europe. So the figure I like to use is this figure from OECD, which says the best of 10th take 28% of all income. You have to go outside of Europe to Singapore and the US to find more unequal countries uh, than that. And if you've got the best off one in 10 of us, which will include probably the majority of people in this room, if you look up the income distribution, you may be surprised to find your household will be in the best off 10th. If the best off 10th are taking a higher share than in any other European country, then the effects on everybody else of becoming poorer is, is even bigger. We've become used to this because the increase in income inequality has happened gradually from around about 1978 onwards. They actually increased under the new Labour years as well. We're used to living in a country where 7% of our children are educated completely separately from the others and you pay for that. That isn't normal in the rest of Europe. We don't think of ourselves as strange, but we are a very, very strange place. This graph might look to you like the graph of inequality in income over time, if you know that. Uh, from 1920, the richest 1% 1 had 20% of all income. It dropped in all countries, went down to around about 6% uh, by the time I was born, 4% after tax and then has risen again to 20% now in the UK and US, but in other European countries they're far more equal. It's not the graph of income inequality. It looks just like the graph of income inequality, but it isn't. Uh, this is the segregation index of conservative voters. Each of those dots is a general election, and this is the proportion of conservative voters you'd have to move if you wanted to spread them equally around the country. Um, I can't answer the question, but it's a bit technical. But these are things that come to my mind after the vote to try and think about what is happening in future. Conservative voters in the 40s, 50s and 60s became pretty evenly spread around the country. This city is a great example. You used to have a, con a concentration of conservative voters because they were unionist voters. That went away no longer became a place of concentrated conservative voters. In fact, it's become a place where it's very, very hard to find a conservative voter. This little thing matters. Who's old enough to have voted in one of the 1974 elections? If you can come up and tell me afterwards if I was right about this. Great. We've got a minority who know. I was there. I campaigned. I knocked on doors. I was very, very young, which I think has an effect or may help slightly on knocking on doors. February 1974, there's a vote. It's two balanced, another one in, in October 1974. Huge increase. You see that jump in the segregation of Conservative voters? That was people in the southeast of England voting Conservative in October 1974. They had had enough. They had had enough of the miners, and the miners winning their strike in 1973. 
They'd had enough of what was happening to Britain in general, that we weren't great, and they voted Tory in large numbers. Not enough for the Conservatives to win the election. Labour won the election in 1974, but it's an unusual event. And then after then, we get this steady and slow increase to now get to the point where we're an incredibly polarised country with parts of Surrey, where almost everybody votes Conservative, and parts of North, where nobody does. And it's hard to get any more polarised than this. You can go back to 1832 and find that you don't get as polarised as this. You've got a country that has divided apart. You've got a Conservative Party, which has an increasingly inefficient distribution of votes. Their votes were going up more and more in the places where they already won seats. They only won elections because their opposition was so fractured. The Conservatives love the fact you've got a Labour Party, Greens, a Liberal Party and whatever. They would never be able to win power without that kind of fracture. It's even better when the Labour Party split into two. Um, but without that fracturing, and then the SNP, without that fracturing, they wouldn't succeed. And a very angry party inside itself, which is why we had the referendum. A party that's very good about appearing not to be angry, um, but actually is a party that doesn't really know what it wants. So that's political background over time to where we are now. This photograph, a friend of mine took it last year in the Cotswolds. He was a bit shocked to go to a country fair in the Cotswolds, very near to David Cameron's constituency, and find all this up. Um, maybe we should have known, really. You know, it's interesting to ask how dislocated were we that we didn't know. It may depend on where you were. Most of you are in Liverpool, and Liverpool is one of the most interesting parts of the country in terms of how it's voted. The Cotswolds voted just to remain, only just. Um, but around them, in most of the south of England, I'll show you a map in a minute, the majority of people voted to leave. The Leave camp won, not because of Middlesbrough, not because of Great Yarmouth and a few other places, Leave Camp won because very, very large numbers of people in the southeast of England and southwest of England voted to leave. Those was where the millions of voters come from. They were crucial. 60% of all voters who voted leave in England lived in the south. 59% were social class A, B and C1 from Lord Ashcroft's polls. Um, it was lack of support for Remain amongst the people you might have thought were going to uh, vote for Remain that caused the result to go the way it did. Ben, who took that picture in the Cotswolds, he's now left the country and is in Iceland. He's got German citizenship, why would he hang around here? For the privilege of getting a work visa to let him work if we deem it's okay if he does. I mean. Why on earth do we think skilled people are going to hang around here? Ben drew these maps. And it's a map of the result. And the map is very interesting. Because if you draw these kind of maps over time, they tend to begin to all look like each other. If you draw a map of where people are ill or where kids fail at school or almost anything you can mention, you get the same pattern. And we didn't get the same pattern. This map shows majority leave or remain, leave is blue, and this shows how strong that vote was. So here are your east coast areas that people talk about, but they're tiny and they don't matter. The number of people living there doesn't matter for the result. Scotland voted because it has a very different politics and the enemy is London. So the narrative simply doesn't work. Take back control means a very different thing in Scotland uh, than it does here. The areas with high numbers of immigrants voted remain. Uh, not because the immigrants voted, because they were not allowed to have a vote, but because people next door to the immigrants were not so scared of the European immigrants. Uh, but also because these were places which were economically successful, because people do not migrate to places which are not economically successful. The worst thing that can happen to an area is not getting any migrants. A few years ago, I was on radio, Doncaster, 
and are speaking just after the last pit was announced to be closed in Doncaster. And we've done an atlas of who was born where in England. And the presenter asked me, so why have we got all these Germans? And I said, I said well, what do you want about? And he went, I've looked at your maps and you say the biggest immigrant group in Doncaster are people born in Germany. And they just announced that the pit had closed. And I had to explain that although they were born in Germany, and that was the biggest group of immigrants in Doncaster, they didn't look very German because they were the children of the Army of the Rhine. And Doncaster produces an unusual number of squaddies, and we sent them out, and then they came back. And this is why UKIP hold their conference in a place like Doncaster, because it doesn't have immigrants uh, in, in Doncaster. So, there's London, 70% in the middle. There's Oxford in its tiny bubble of 70% support. Here's Manchester, here's Liverpool. But look at all the blue in the south. What's, what's going on there? And I can't help thinking it's very similar to something like the debate about grammar schools. The public are pretty supportive of grammar schools. When you look at polling, the latest I seen was 2014 about grammar schools. Apart from Scotland, you'll find a majority of adults are often in favour of grammar schools. Slightly fewer who've got children. Um, but they're in favour. Now, a little bit of this is that when you actually ask them, do, they, do you think your child will pass 11 plus, the majority say yes. You know, so they're optimistic um, and they're in favour. But they're also being offered something different and they don't like what we've got. And that something different can even be a hark back to the past. But if you don't like what we've got, if you don't like what the country has become, and you're only offered one option for change, in this case, grammar schools instead of bog standard schools everywhere, Brexit instead of things will continue just as they have been, then you go for the option of, of change. Um, I spent a day in Tewkesbury um, trying to understand this because Tewkesbury voted 56% leave. I managed to spot four people in 12 hours who were not completely white in Tewkesbury. Um, there is a tiny Polish shop if you really look in Tewkesbury. Um, but there's also a tattoo artist on the main street. There's a pound shop on the main street. There's a run-down cafe. And the houses cost too much for people's children to be able to actually buy them. But they haven't got any better than when they were built in the 1950s or 1930s. If you take a step back and look at the country outside of London, away from a thriving university centre, a lot of it looks quite run down and it isn't even cheap to live there. I think there are good reasons why people are upset. Now if you remember, I said you had to memorise that map at the start. Uh, the reason was to understand this map. This is a map of Europe, everybody gets equal amount of space, and areas are coloured blue if there are a lot of immigrants. That was Switzerland, for anybody who could remember. Loads of immigrants in Switzerland. This is somebody born in another country who lives in that country. There's London, which of course voted Remain. That's where our immigrants are. We don't have many immigrants. We think we do. We have more than we had before. But compared to other parts of Europe and other cities, there's nothing exceptional about us. The place with loads of immigrants is Spain. And who's the biggest group of immigrants in Spain? And are you ready to welcome them back? Have you geared the hospital up for them? Because they're going to need it. Because they can't pay privately in Spain, most of them. Remember, they get their pension in pounds. That's going to be great, isn't it? How many are going to be coming back in the next few months, do you think? Anyway. Um, so the point of that, Northern Ireland, of course, has lots of people born in other countries and voted to remain. It's not about immigrants. It really isn't about immigrants. Um, it just doesn't work geographically. The fear was about immigrants. The tabloids have been talking about immigrants for decades. We managed to get immigration up as the most salient issue on every election apart from 2010. And it only just beat, was only just beaten by the economy in 2010 after the most almighty crash in economic history. 
by, and then the population of Britain for a minute could stop worrying about immigrants only at one election after that. And now the NHS is just beating it by a fraction, but don't worry, we'll get to worry about immigrants again. In fact, we're going to worry about immigrants until we start worrying about immigrants for another reason, because we can't get them. And there may be a silver lining to all of this. Apologies for the technical side of these graphs, but these graphs really matter to me now in hindsight. What this is showing is data from the British Household Panel Study on the number of people who said they were completely satisfied with their health. 2009, 10, 11, 12. People who are mostly dissatisfied with their health. Jumps from 6% to over 13%. Uh, when I first showed this to a professor of medicine, he just said, Artifact, mistake, question wordings change, samples change. You never get that. It never happens. You never see something like that. If you ever see it, it's a mistake. This is an official statistic of ONS. It's one of the components of David Cameron's happiness index. Do you remember Cameron in 2000 telling you you were going to measure happiness? We measure it every year, monitor it. We did measure it every year. Just nobody bothered to look. That's what we do in this country. We, we start measuring things and nobody checks what's actually happened. People became, particularly old people, became dramatically less satisfied with their health. 2, 10, 11, 12. You might say, oh, that's just psychological or something. But then, in 2012 and 13, they started dying in greater numbers. And by June 2015, we had an increase of 52,000 deaths on the year before, which only has a tiny amount to do with flu. The majority of the additional deaths were from dementia, um, and other diseases associated with old age, and they were very elderly people in care homes who were very frail, and we've cut the NHS budget in real terms, and we've cut adult social care massively, and more people have died. And we have our first fall coming up in life expectancy since the war. David Cameron will be the first Prime Minister who left office with life expectancy falling. There's no bigger failure than that. All of this begins to point me to think, you know, the reality of 52,000 additional deaths is many more tens of thousands of people doing very, very, very badly who don't die. It's a country abandoning its old as a price worth paying as the money runs out. This is who's affected by the cuts. Evan Davis, if you know Evan Davis from Newsnight, he's a bit of an economist, his reaction to this is, oh, but they got the triple lock. What use is the triple lock an extra 50p or two pounds on your pension. If your hip goes and you're living in a little cottage in rural Oxfordshire and you can't drive a car anymore and you're 80 and the rural bus service is gone and Meals and Wheels is gone and the cottage hospital's being closed down. It's very, very interesting in hindsight. Part of what worries me is that if the vote hadn't gone this way, would we have really noticed or when would we have noticed these things that, that have happened? This graph comes from IMF data. It's the proportion of our GDP that we raise in taxes and spend on public services. Where the black line, we spend just under 40% back in 2002. That's the naughty Labour not fixing the roof when the sun shines bit, the overspending, if you remember it. This is bailing out the banks. That's Osborne's cuts. That's the projected cuts. Uh, that very unremarkable man who's now our Chancellor, who I have even forgotten his name, which I think tells you a lot about him, is hardly going to alter that line at all. Uh, we are on task to spend just 36% of GDP. Remember, less GDP than we used to have because it's gone down. And it's not even going to buy us that much because the pound's going down. <laughs> Compared to all these other countries. I need to speed up and, and end to ask questions about this. But again, you look at things in a very different light. Yeah. We have chosen to be a low-tax, low-public-spending country. We have chosen to fund our hospitals with a very efficient NHS, but to fund them at less per head than anywhere, like I said, apart from Italy and Greece, and only less, Italy and Greece only spend less than us since their crashes. That's quite incredible. The Swiss spend twice as much per head on healthcare than we do. And inequality in Switzerland, and Switzerland is hardly a radical socialist state, 
the top 1% in Switzerland take half as much as our top 1% take. And they still have bankers. Right? We are a very, very strange country. That's the rise in immigration. Yes, it looks like a lot. It's 8 million, 9, 8 million, 8 and a bit by 2011 from a huge range of countries. For years and years, it was Ireland, as you well know in Liverpool. Um, the graph you can't see, which is much harder to draw, is a graph which looks almost identical, which is emigration. Because for most of this time, in fact, earlier, we were sending out far more people. Uh, but we send out a large number of people. It's not especially high. It's certainly not high enough to make up for the fact that we haven't had two babies per couple since the late 1960s. Um, but that's what it looks like. Just two slides to go, so please think of questions, because I'm much more interested in what you have to say, in a way, than what I have to say about speculation. That's the budget cuts from, la from the last budget. I, what I'm trying to argue is, in this rather confused manner, is that the result told us something very interesting about ourselves that we should have known about ourselves. And it told us that things were bad. I don't think it matters that much whether Article 50 is enacted by March or not. It's been kicked in the long grass. March is the latest you can say you're going to enact it because we have to have European elections <laughs> otherwise, and that would be very embarrassing. Um, the British don't like embarrassment, or at least the English don't. I think we've already done it. We've already said that we're very unhappy. We've already publicly said that we really don't like these people coming who staff our schools and run our health service who we don't pay for their education. I think we're already changing. Um, and the change, if you want an analogy, is very like the biggest change in my mother's life in British politics, which was Suez, the Suez Crisis. And the Suez Crisis was when we discovered that we were no longer a world power and we couldn't go around doing what we used to do. What we're about to discover, what we're already discovering, what some people might take another two or three years to get, is similar, but it's economic. We're not going to suddenly become rich again. George Osborne had a target that by 2030 we'd be the richest country in the world again per capita. Right? It's not going to happen. The good news is that we're not going to be told it's not happening because we fail to leave Europe or vote to leave Europe. Um, and the problem is that we are trying to adapt to becoming a normal country and failing to do it and becoming poorer. And we're still stuck with this in our head because it takes a long time to adjust to becoming a normal country. So by leaving reality, what I actually mean is finally, finally leaving behind the idea that we're somehow superior, that we should be running the world, that we're especially productive people, that we got all of this because our meals were particularly efficient and we were good at trading. We didn't, we just sold opium to the Chinese and made them buy it. Every Chinese school child knows this. None of our school children know this. We have a legacy of believing that we are great for a reason. Hence the great reform bill. At some point the word great will get overused and we'll just have to stop uh, doing it. I'm not talking Britain down. It's always hard for any place that has been at the centre of the world and the richest and most powerful place in the world to finally adapt to being normal. And it always has an effect on people when you are that powerful. William Beveridge, who you remember as one of the authors of the welfare state, wrote a book when he was a little bit younger in which he said that people like him had a duty to have four children for the good of the race by which he meant the magnificent English race. Uh, which we, and that was commonplace, that kind of idea. 
We never worked out that we made our money because we forced our colonies to buy our goods. We thought we were special. And then we called it the English disease in the 1970s when we couldn't make as much money, which was because we no longer controlled India and controlled countries in Africa. If you look at the rhetoric coming from conservative ministers at the moment, they're all quoting Palmerston and other things because they were brought up in schools that told them how wonderful the empire was and never told them about the reality of the opium trade and what else we did. When my grandfather was born, you could buy $5 for a pound. In the year my mum was born, you could buy $4 for a pound. When I was born, you could buy $3 for a pound. I can remember going to France with school when I was 15 and how rich I was. When my children were born, you could buy $2 for a pound. I give it to Easter. Don't know. That's and of course, if you change money now at Heathrow, you'll actually find you're lucky to get one euro for a pound. It's been a slow and steady fall. Okay, with some blips, which is why we talk about 1985. It was $5 to a pound because we controlled world markets and currency. We're heading down to a point where we will eventually have to do things which are actually of value to other people in the world rather than to trick them into giving money to our banks. We're actually going to have to do something of use to be able to get Marmite being sent across the channel. Right? And it's hard to accept. That thing of use can include teaching people in English in universities. There's all kinds of things we can do. It is not going to be trading with Australia. It really isn't. The one advantage of being a professor of geography is I've got a rough idea about what Aust where Australia is, a rough idea where we are, and I've got some idea about what Australia makes and who really wants it. And we don't want to burn that much coal. Um, leaving reality, in a way, is entering into accepting reality. Becoming a normal country. We've just chosen to do it in a particularly painful way as we did with Suez, as we've done in numerous other slightly embarrassing examples in the past. What's a normal European country like? It has many political parties. We're slowly getting there. It has a fair voting system. We failed on that one, but you know. We kind of voted the wrong way in the wrong referendum. A normal European country has a fairly successful right-wing party, where we kind of had that with UKIP. They're not doing so well now, but I'm sure they'll come back again. And it's very European to have somebody like UKIP in Europe. I think that whatever happens, whether it's a hard Brexit, a soft Brexit, or no Brexit, we have changed. The establishment didn't think this was going to happen. That is why the BBC gave equal amount of time to both sides of the debate because the BBC thought there was no chance of Leave winning, otherwise they would have gone the other way. I've yet to find somebody in the BBC who's not a Remainer. And it isn't just the BBC, it's the majority of MPs, it's the people around High Table in Oxford and Cambridge, it's the whole of the establishment doesn't want Leave. So it's going to be really interesting to watch what occurs, but we've gone and shot ourselves in the foot already, because we've told all those mainland Europeans that we don't really like them very much. And the biggest effect is going to be on people who are currently living in Italy and France and Germany who are thinking about becoming over at the age of 23 to be a school teacher for a year in Oxford. Because boy, do we need school teachers every year to come. And you're sitting there thinking, I was going to come. Are you going to come now? So how are we going to staff our schools? How are we going to get our midwives? 30% of midwives in some hospitals in London. You really do need midwives. You know, there's other jobs you don't need, but if you want to... Um, leaving reality is partly learning about reality. Please think of questions to ask me. I haven't got all the answers, and I've already told you I didn't think it was going to go this way. I thought it was going to go slightly the other way. But... I thought we would then have years and years and years of people shooting, saying we should have left, we should have left, let's have enough referendum. 
the one thing this will do is accelerate the move towards us finally becoming a little bit more normal, finally maybe educating our children together, doing things that other countries do, or if you want to argue with me, maybe we'll sail off, become the richest country in the world, attract all the billionaires in and it'll all be great and our children can work for them in future. I just don't think that's going to happen. Thank you very much.